Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on what part of the world you're tuning in from. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. Um, certainly a lot of everybody. It's over, over 400 people uh, uh, attending the show. So, Alex, uh, congratulations. Uh, certainly a lot of people, uh, a lot of people interested uh, in, in the topic. And uh, some of you also uh, may have uh, been familiar with Alex already from the expert, uh, the Safe Connection expert panel series. Um, Alex has been with us uh, on the ones in Europe, as well as the ones in North America. Um, there's also been some expert panel series that I've been the moderator for, uh, for companies that put on conferences in Europe, like GLC, and HSE Global Series, and Alex has been with me on those. Um, a, a couple of highlights from that, if you might recall, uh, one of them we did was on, uh, you know, serious injuries versus recordable injuries, and recordable injuries have come down, but the serious injuries and fatalities have not. And I was basically posing the questions to the panelists saying, okay, so you know, you can go back and look at what you were doing for what I would call the, the usual suspects, confined space, uh, high voltage, working at heights, high temperature, high pressure. Go back and look at what you were doing, procedures, standards for those things. Or you could, if, you know, you were satisfied with that um, and you didn't think you were going to get anywhere there, you could go look somewhere new. And so, you know, the panelists discussed this, but Alex actually just said, well, you know, given how serious it is, why wouldn't you just do both? That's what we did. We went back and we looked and not everything was as good as we thought it should be. So we fixed that up. But we also looked in a new direction and that's sort of how we ended up uh, working with you folks, Larry, with Safe Start. Um, so, you know, that all kind of fit and made sense to me. Like when it's serious, why wouldn't you just cover both bases instead of just going one way or another? Um, and then when we were talking about balancing just culture and accountability, I thought one of the things that Alex brought up that was really, I mean, there was a lot of good stuff from that show and we all realized we were just scratching the surface. But um, Alex said, well, you can't, you can't just separate safety accountability out. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of performance standards that people are held accountable for. And, and there are things like theft and espionage that also have zero tolerance. So it, it all has to be balanced within the accountability structure of the, of the company, you know, holistically. So, you know, I, I've, I really, Alex, I think your ability to see the whole actually is, is one of the things that's probably, um, you know, it's probably got you where, where you're going. I mean, when I first met Alex, uh, everybody, uh, we had already done uh, uh, fairly well with the critical error reduction techniques in terms of reducing injuries around the globe, um, thousands and thousands of folks. Um, and uh, But we started talking about basketball right off the bat. I'm not exactly sure how we got into it, but Alex played Division I basketball in the United States. Um, for those of you who are not from North America, um, I, I played in the Canadian team when we played Division I teams in the United States. It wasn't a given that we would win. So Alex is a good ball player. And if you played a lot of sports, I mean, you would not never separate human error from human performance. I mean, in, in sports like tennis, they actually track the number of unforced errors. So it's just, it's just a natural part of it. But when you think about making steel, about making, you know, uh, gasoline, or when you think about making cars, it's not maybe you think about system performance, maybe instead of, instead of human performance. So, um, Alex, let me, let me just read the blurb for everybody in case um, our, our audience didn't memorize it, which would be quite likely. Um, and then uh, I'd like to just start right in if I could, but Here's the sort of the title, everybody. Um, Integrating human factors in equality, production efficiency, and customer relations with Alex Carnival, uh, president and CEO uh, of Dynacast, and he's a former chief performance officer at, at eTex. 
So why are lessons learned combined with tremendous success so difficult to spread from safety and health to other departments in the organization? Um, is it just the silo effect? Uh, is it the message or is it the messenger? Um, some safety professionals aren't at the same you know, pay grade or management level as some of the other folks perhaps. Um, is it that the managers of the other departments view safety as something that they have to contribute to in terms of time and money, but it gives them nothing directly in return? Uh, in other words, the sprocket needs to be guarded, but the guard doesn't make this thing go any faster. So, you know, it doesn't increase production. Um, or perhaps it's because many quality managers follow what Deming said, you know, 85-15, 85% system, 15% individual. But, you know, that was 40 years ago. And many companies by now have achieved Six Sigma reliability within their manufacturing processes. Uh, unfortunately, um, well, myself included here, uh, very few humans have achieved Six Sigma reliability. Um, and now most people are doing more or being asked to do more than ever before. So is the leverage now with the people or is it with the system? And again, you know, I think, Alex, I'd come right back to what you said before. You know, well, why wouldn't you look at both? Um, and anyhow, data from multinational companies and a broad selection of industries confirms that significant improvements or reductions in scrap, unscheduled downtime, first run defects or customer complaints occurred simultaneously when they received training on human factors and critical error reduction techniques but it was difficult to push that out to the other departments in the business. And now you've got uh, a new organization, Alex, a billion dollar organization, actually. Um, and so obviously we want to hear how you're going to, uh, what you're going to do in the future. And, and, and certainly, um, you know, to, to maybe minimize a bit of the silo effect. But like I said to everybody, um, I, I caught up with you basically, I guess, Division One basketball, um, but it's obviously some steps to get from there to uh, to, to where you are now. So um, uh, maybe just if you could, just a you know, brief history bio, Alex, of how, uh, how, how, how this kind of came to be. And then um, we, we can start right in with sort of uh, – what do you think sort of the uh, the trials? Well, I mean, I, I was with you with the, the pilot, so I know some of them, but I mean, we can start talking to people about, uh, you know, the success and then the difficulty and then, you know, what you're going to do next. But um, what, what happened from Division One to now? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Larry. I mean, it's, it's great from to be Larry, here with you. I mean, stuff like that, too. So, yeah. I think our vision was actually just recording one of our conversations for an hour because it always seems like we we get into solving many of the world's issues. So we'll, we'll see what we can do here today. Um, but yeah, just a really brief background for me, for the people who don't know. Uh, I'm a little bit of a, an oddball. I'm an American who's actually lived in Europe for more than the past 20 years. I'm a chemical engineer by training for more than 30 years ago. I grew up in a corporate environment, which was Allied Signal, which later became Honeywell. So I learned a lot about engineering, a lot of process-driven improvement during that time. And then I spent about eight years after they sold our business working still with the same business, but under a private equity owner you know, as a portfolio company. And there it was a different set of muscles in terms of speed, urgency, firm, clear data and decision-making and things like that. And then I spent five years at ETEX, as you mentioned, uh, as a chief performance officer. And ETEX is a private family-held company uh, based out of Belgium, but a, but a worldwide global company that was was very good in a lot of aspects, but was a highly decentralized company that did not have a lot of process historically. And, you know, that was the opportunity to try to keep an entrepreneurial spirit while really, really making it more process driven and, and, and sort of bringing it forward. And, you know, that's what, what I spent the time there with. And as you mentioned now, uh, I've just started a new challenge with a, a group called Dynacast, which is another international global company, um, a very good company, uh, started just over the past month coming in. I'm very impressed in terms of the people, the processes, the technology, but as with all companies, a lot of opportunities and a lot in the same directions as far as 
as far as bringing together a little bit more of a singular look to, to customers, bringing together some processes and, and even just sharing best practices internally. Um, and, and, and yeah, so that, that's the basis. I mean, I'm, I've gone from sort of being an engineer into more of a, 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 a leader and a, and a business leader. And you said a word that I think is really important both for me and I think for this discussion, and that's holistic. Because I think however we look at things, whether it's safety or, or, or why it does or doesn't transition over to the other areas of improvement, I think at the end of the day, ultimately you have to try to find a holistic approach that really incorporates multiple elements and primarily the, the, the people and the, and the leadership aspects. So um, you gave me a lot to unpack as far as that, but maybe we, maybe you can, you know, we can sort of dive into one area here. And we still live in Luxembourg with you. And oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, I I met and married a Luxembourg citizen more than twenty years ago, so that's really the basis here. I've got kids that are sort of dual citizens. Um, that one may start going to the U.S. next next year for university. So, and I mean, the pleasure of my life and my career is that I've gotten to work worldwide. I mean, across all cultures, from Asia to South America, Europe, and North America, and North America. And you know, I see both the commonalities and some of the differences. You know, both for safety and for uh, for what we're talking about here and i'm a really really big believer in you know based on how we worked about the behavioral aspect and why trying to understand and, and drive the human element is is so critical no matter what you're doing what um i, I know you told me but uh, what continents are you operating in with dynacast uh you, you mentioned north america you said there was some operations in canada uh you yeah. know europe um yeah, and, and Asia. It's really, and it's just about equally split, almost one third in each of those regions. So it's a pretty well represented uh, company from that standpoint. And not, not Latin America, though, or Australia so much? Not, not today. Not, you know. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Alex, um, I'll let you just say if you can, uh, we, uh, you can sort of just take us a bit back to, uh, you know, where you were with ETEX, uh, you know, sort of why you, uh, made the decision to, to go forward. I, I was I wasn't part of it. Like I said, when I'm when I met you, things yeah. were, were were well on their way and thankfully successfully um well well on their well on their way. So it was a it was a meeting I was looking forward to as opposed to uh you know they right. they stalled or uh you know you gotta go help this operations manager because he can't seem to get another division on board. Um, and it, it was, it was super, you said, well, I, 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 and I, I think, think it's a pretty good, um, you know, like we spent 30 minutes or more talking about basketball, which I don't think he knew anything about, but nevertheless, um, so what happened prior to me getting there with ETEX? How did, how did that get set up that you got, I yeah, know, 14, I mean, it's a little, people it's a little bit of a, something. Yeah, it's a little bit of a classic story. I mean, Etex had even before I had gotten there done some really good things in terms of improving safety. Um, but the, the the situation was that we had reached a plateau, you know, so a lot of improvement over eight to 10 years. And then for a year or two, very small to maybe not even any improvement below a certain level. So the basis was, look, we're doing all these things. We're making equipment better. We're trying to give people good training. We're trying to write good procedures, but something's missing. And at the end of the day, what was missing was the behavioral aspect, which is exactly what we work with you on and work with Safe Start on. And, you know, this started when I was there and continued even over the past year. And ETEX has continued to improve its, its safety record and actually had a very good performance in 2020, you know, well, well below what that, that plateau was that, we were, that, that, I, that I mentioned there. So, you know, we, we had seen this and I think it made a total amount of sense in terms of the behavioral element. And, and the, the saying I used to use within ETEX that I think applies everywhere is, what I realized was the behavioral aspect of safety is the only thing that matters in the moment, okay? In other words, of course you need to work on improving equipment and guarding and safeguards, and of course you need to make your procedures as sound as possible, but you can't affect that this moment to the next. You know, that's what you have to go work on sort of offline and get that in. So in the moment, the moment when somebody could get hurt or not get hurt or a mistake could be made or not get made, the only thing you have is the human element about awareness, right decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So I, that's I, what remember, really I remember when you said that on the panel or uh, David Bianca, we resonated with him directly. He was, they were just like, 
we, we all kind of went, you know, for right or wrong, you are where you are right now. Exactly. You know, so. Right. And again, and it's what you're saying. The holistic approach is it doesn't mean you just accept where you are. We would do constant audits. We would we would try to improve the equipment. We had CapEx programs to improve, you know, all of that. You, of course, you continue to work that. But the human element just couldn't be ignored. And of course, there are statistics that we all know about, you know, doing 90 and 98 percent of all incidents have some type of human element with it. So, so mm -hmm. it, it's all very clear when we look at it that way. And the thing about safety is it's one of those that nobody can really argue with. Of course, you're going to work on it. Of course, you don't want people to get hurt. So it had a little bit more of a natural, you know, momentum or a natural, you know, fuel to go and do this. So then what you and I talked about was, the, you know, there was some there was anecdotal and some empirical evidence of places that had done behavior based safety where there was associated improvements in other areas. Right. Quality, mm -hmm. productivity, you know, all of that. And I think the question we were talking about was, it makes sense. It's the same muscle groups. It's the same basis. What can we do to actually not just have that happen by chance, but actually apply the same principles, set up a program, et cetera, et cetera, that's going to make it happen. And I think that's, and that became, I think, the basis for what we're talking about here. That wasn't as natural and wasn't as straightforward as what you and I sort of thought it could be. That we take, boy, if you're doing these things, if you take the human element and people are more aware and they're triggering on their on their on their uh, you know their 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 their, their, their states and, and figuring out how to correct things and putting fixes in, then of course that has to apply to everything else. Mm -hmm. But we yeah, saw I mean, on a yeah, yeah, text, it wasn't as straightforward. Like oh, it's the same pattern. You just just look now at four different risk, four different risk uh, triangle mm -hmm. ones for quality. Well, for production, yeah. ones for safety, and ones for customer relations, and realize that you don't get to control. It's not just where on the triangle you don't always get to control. You don't get to control which triangle the outcome is going to fall in. It can be more than one sometimes. You can end up with bingo, all four, where it costs you time, money, you, you, you have a negative customer experience, and the truck driver got hurt when he rolled the truck over, right? So you got all of them at once. But if you only rolled the truck over and the truck driver was wearing a seatbelt and he didn't get hurt or she didn't get hurt, it still costs you time, it still costs you money, and you've still got a negative customer experience. And the contributing factors were all the same thing. And I just couldn't understand why the whole yeah. world wasn't like running like beating a path to my door and i'm like going I i'm here you know i'm opening the, i'm you know like I, I think, and i think i thought about it it's down now we're ready and it's like well, you gotta be and kidding. i think what I, I think what you're saying and what i'll say is that yes it, it seems very direct to me that the same things you'd work on as far as safety from a behavioral standpoint should impact every other area the same way. If you're making less mistakes, if you're being more aware, if you're um, triggering and observing and fixing things, you know, so, so I think the basis is there, okay? You know, but, but I think there are a couple of reasons because as we, as we talk through it and I thought about it over and over, and one is, Larry, for as good as you are, you don't give instant gratification, <laughs> okay? And I'm, I don't wanna say that in a mean way, but, the, the, the nature of the beast that we're talking about here is you've got to have sort of these, these changes. They're observable over time and they're observable over sort of a, a, a large set of data. And a lot of times in productivity and in operations, you want to see sort of that immediate measurable return and change. And that's one thing that I think is different. There is a leap of faith when you're talking about bringing in the, um, the human element and saying that it's going to be improved. Um, there's a parallel though between safety and between productivity in that, you know, people on the phone, they could be, you could be sitting back and saying, well, the goal should be to take the human element out of improve of, of productivity, right? Build machines, do automation, ultimately even AI and things like that. And or, or an assembly line idea, right? Where you, you know, you minimize the task so that the performance right. can be pretty, pretty and, standardized. Yes. Yeah. And the answer is it's an and and just like safety is just like in safety, you're going to work on those things. Of course, in productivity, you're going to work on the same things. But one of the difference when you're working on the non safety improvements is, I believe, 
for most leaders or for a lot of leaders, there's still a stigma about human mistakes. Okay. We, we didn't do this perfectly, but a lot, one of the elements of doing behavior based safety is that you try to make it not a blame, a blaming culture. You actually want to highlight and recognize the, the deficiency, the error, the mistake. Yeah, the common so you can correct it. Actually, of it all, right? You know, like you've all, right. you've all done, you've all done this. You've all exceeded your own speed limit when you were in enough of a rush. You just right. have, like, you know, so don't look at the exception that this guy made today as some sort of singular experience in humanity. Every one of us has made exceptions to what we normally do because of rushing, frustration, fatigue, and complacency. So, you know, getting all of that out, I think, is, is a help, Alex. But if, is it, um, as I know you and I talked about this before, too, and that, you know, and it's part of the title of the, the session, you know, why are the lessons learned? If, if a fork truck driver backed a fork truck off the loading dock and was severely injured, there would be a root cause analysis. The last thing we would be looking for is blame. The first thing we're trying to do is make sure something this serious never happens again. But if that same fork truck driver or same person in the shipping department shipped three transport truck, 150 skids worth of product to their best customer instead of their second best customer, easy mistake to make we talked about how likely would it be that that person's rap sheet would be much more in focus in other words how many mistakes has this person made in the last couple of months how many big mistakes and if the person hadn't made any mistakes in a while probably it'd be like hey he's really you know hasn't done this before try to be more careful you know in the future but if the person made a lot of mistakes before, it might be one more and you're out the door or this might be out the door right now. But there wouldn't be the same root cause blame free analysis that we would. We, so in other words, again, some of the painful but valuable yeah. lessons learned in safety not taken over after the fact reactively as well too. Then, so, but then Larry, I think there's a couple of levels when we're talking about mistakes or talking about things that can be corrected. In a way, the big obvious ones like what you just mentioned actually do get addressed one way or another. It goes to ultimately whatever your leadership culture is as far as whether it's a culture of consequence or a culture of changing and learning and all that. But the big mistakes I'd say probably do but I think the secret or the key to a lot of the, the productivity, just like it is in safety, is the hundreds and the thousands of little mistakes that happen all the time. You know, the loss of efficiency from using the wrong page or, or, or entering data wrong or having, you know, um, doing a missed schedule or something. And, and these are the things that really add up in terms of the total. And th that's why it's harder to sort of track that as, a, as, as each individual instance but it's when taken together, it really does it does it does matter in terms of the the, the total efficiency and the effectiveness. Yeah, I so. use I use the term hull speed when I'm talking to our folks. I said, you know, you you, you just you, these little things that you don't think about every day. Like if you if you got rid of them, you become much more efficient. Just like the boat, you know, the the boat can go faster now with the same amount of wind. You know that kind right. of kind of thing. But you don't. You're right. You don't. You, and because you make so many little mistakes every day, you don't notice them either. It's no big deal, right? You drop your car right. keys, you drop your phone, unless something cracks, you don't really pay attention to it, let alone analyze it. But you could, you know, you could learn from that just as much as if, as if your phone did crack, and then you had to think about it a lot. To, Alex, with with getting those techniques that were so successful in safety through to the other divisions and stuff like that. Uh, I, I didn't I never sensed any 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 malicious or, or malintent barriers. Um, but there were, I don't know, invisible I, I, invisible barriers, perhaps. Um, could you just like do you think it was I I just want you to if you can comment a bit, do you think it's it's silo effect? Do you think it's because of the paradigm people have that safety is about hazards, the laws are all about the hazards, and so it's it's much more about the hazards and the guarding than it is about the quality and the production um or just do you think it's more the deming thing 
why do you think in general there isn't sort of a a, a much more natural um you know yeah I, I mean i mean i think there's there's several things i mean i think that there's definitely a, there's definitely always going to be the organizational bandwidth question as far as how much and how many things an organization can pay attention to and dive into at any one time and then you combine that with what you just called maybe the silo effect that people will view well we do this for safety but we need to work on these other things differently you work on quality or work on supply chain or work on on manufacturing when you know one of the lessons i think i've taken over my career is the common thread for all of that is leadership and its culture and it's you know what you base your norms and decisions on so i think if you can actually get it to where things were boiled down into a more cultural and 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 norms given discussion which is a lot of what we did at etex then it becomes a lot clearer we actually drove what we called a consistent set of leadership principles and what it what it meant to do was not to tell a leader if this if x happens then you do y no, it was get everybody at least aligned on what the principles are, how we want to work, what, what we value in terms of agility, in terms of feedback, in terms of transparency. And then any situation that comes around, you sort of know the way that, that you can deal with it from a leadership standpoint. And so when we're talking about making improvements across different things, then it becomes, well, we should be working on safety and productivity almost in the same way, that we should be getting to root causes, that we should be sharing the information, that we should be you know, being very clear about what the, the final you know, uh, solutions or the decisions are and things like that. So I think there's always that organizational you know, bandwidth question about how much, how much you can handle. And, and, and I think then, then it's, you know, we, again, it's, it's, it's this stigma of the human error. One thing I think that I thought about from the macro standpoint that's happening in the world is, as you mentioned, between Deming and Six Sigma and Lean, there's been massive improvements and massive breakthroughs in terms of productivity. And these are all driven by process, right? The way you attack problems, the way you put solutions in and all of that. And I think that's, that's moved the world to a much different place from productivity. But if you look at the world today, we used to talk about this in e-text, we say it's a VUCA world. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's, amb it's amb ambiguous. You know, It's not a certain world. Things change, things move fast, things are that. And actually, what that says is that the human element, the human ability to take in different pieces of information and uncertain information and information that may be wrong and processing it into action becomes really, really more critical right now. And it probably will be up until the time when artificial intelligence actually can do all of that all the time, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in other words, I think we're actually seeing a shift where in many areas, in creativity and in innovation and in strategy, in, in setting your, your mission, the human element becomes even more important. And, you know, it may sound like I'm think I'm talking about things that are outside of the world of productivity or quality or things like that, but I'm not because what makes productivity and quality and all of that go is actually having a coherency and having a very, very good, consistent plan that people understand. Because you and I talked about this. There's lots of great productivity things out there. You know, mm -hmm. you can you can go get consultants all day. We can pull off uh, the shelf exactly what Six Sigma and Lean and, and the Deming method is and all that. It's all there. It's a science. But some companies do it really well and some don't see any impact at all. And the difference is your people and your culture and your ability to actually implement and have that stick. And the behavioral aspects that we talked about in behavior-based safety and translating, to me, that's the secret sauce to make that happen. And that's where I see the connection. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I, I think I mentioned this to you in calls before and, and everybody listening, like Alex, Alex and I just sometimes phone, phone each other, just talk for hours. But um, the, with healthcare, that obviously there's a tremendous uh, concern, financial liability risk for patient risk, patient safety, malpractice, human error. Um, in North America, uh, medical error is the third leading cause of death, like heart attack and stroke are number one, cancer is number two, and, and medical errors 
number three. So there's a huge concern for this and, you know, literally billions and billions of dollars in lawsuits. Um, there's also another division within the healthcare consortiums, you know, huge hospital consortiums with 50, 60 hospitals and so on, that will be looking after staff safety and ergonomics. And the gentleman who is in charge of a, a big region in California for staff safety and ergonomics, um, he, he listened to the session, you know, what came out, uh, I think he actually got certified as a trainer on critical error reduction techniques. And he wanted me to come down and talk to his leadership group. And I said, well, can you get the people from, from risk management to come out as well? And he said, that would be a great idea, but I don't know any of them. Like he didn't like, I can look it up. I'm sure it's somewhere in the company, you know, thing I can find out from HR who it is, but I don't know any, like they, the idea that you're both working on the same problem and you don't know it um, yeah. was to me that, okay, so obviously that's, that's a, the most exaggerated silo effect that I've ever been, you know, sort of uh, confronted no, but, with. But you, you actually bring up, a, you bring up an example that has a ton of meat to it, because if you think about and take as part of healthcare, take, take the emergency room doctor or the triage doctor, okay? There's a, an obviously extremely human element here to the person who has, you know, patients yeah. coming in left and right and has to decide, do this, do this you know, this one can wait, this one needs immediate, this one gets sent here. That's a very, very critical decision-making role that has a very, very fundamental human element to it where you want that human to be as sharp as possible. Now, there are a myriad of things. There's a ton of things that can be done process-wise to help that, right? There's been lots of studies and lots of results that say the better your data system is, right? The better information that that doctor has, as far as what symptoms are, what the patient history is, you know, what the situation is, how many beds are available, et cetera, et cetera, that helps those decisions happen. So that's the process side of things. That's where working the process and working it to where you have this really efficient thing helps. But at the end of the day, you're helping the human element because at the end of the day, the doctor is the one that has to make those calls, you know, that based on that information. So I think it's a very nice parallel in terms of what we're talking about here that you want the doctor to be in the best state possible. Ideally, even if it's a chaotic situation, you don't want him personally to feel frustrated or rushed or fatigued, okay? But, but beyond that, yes, you build it up with all the process and all the, all the information and all the data. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you remember the one, uh, the one webinar we were on with Ed Stevens from ABB where he said he actually went out and they, did, they solicited sources of frustration from people and then, you know, posted when they got those things closed out, you know, not everything tomorrow, but they got, they got it. They got, and as they systematically eliminated, like to your point, now you've enabled better performance with the worker. Cause you've, you, you know, you, if you're mad, you're thinking about what's making you mad. You're not thinking about what you're doing. Right. Okay. Right. So like part of it maybe was the silo effect. Part of it might've been, you know, paradigms, Alex, in terms of hazards and safety and being, you know, uh, about the guarding and the controlling and making sure you got the right respirator cartridge and stuff like that. Um, doesn't affect me, doesn't affect whether I'll get a promotion. So, you know, I've got to support it as a human being, but I don't necessarily support it the same way I support you as a co-basketball player on my team and pass you the ball when you're open. That it's it's not that kind of cooperation so that might be a bit of it um before i you know talk to you for hours and hours um what about the new like going going forward with you know like, like and i don't want everybody to think like all the lessons learned like alex and i've got it all figured out now and so you know any productivity problem you've got just fire it our way and we'll uh We'll wave our magic wands and solve it for you. Um, but you know, you've you've got a you know you've got a a, a fairly significant group of people that uh, you're going to work with going forward here. Now, um, what tell us kind of how you're 
what your plans are or, you know, any, any preventative, you know, preemptive strikes. I don't know. Uh, I'm not really, I'm not really sure. Alex, just go tell us how you go about this. Uh, well, it is an interesting time, Larry, because you know, that we, you and I are talking, maybe, maybe after all of this, all of us will write books called, you know, life in the time of COVID, right. For example, but you know, my style and you know, I've developed sort of a leadership philosophy and a style over the years that, is really, really based on connecting with people because I do think every company wants to say, you know, get your people working, have great people, push it down into the organization, have people make decisions, you know, for themselves. And the reality is whether that happens or not depends on you as a leader and me as a leader as far as what trust I really build up both directions. How much do I trust the team and how much do they trust me? And so that's one of the big challenges in entering a company at the time of COVID is not being able to do as easily or as readily or as frequently face-to-face meetings and, 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 and all of that. But what I've done, I mean, I started with, with, uh, with Dynacast just over a month ago, and I did something a little bit unconventional maybe for a new leader because I, you know, and this maybe is the changing of the times. I grew up in the Honeywell and GE environment where it was numbers, numbers, numbers and private equity, even, you know, even though I'm working under it now. And most leaders that when they come in, I think would immediately dive into the books and dive into reviews and do business reviews every day. And I, I really haven't done almost any of that. You know, I've got some very capable people that I've jumped into. I'm lucky. We've got um, executive vice presidents who work under me that I think are very, very experienced and very good and know how to run the business in terms of day to day. So my approach was the holistic one. I wanted to build relationships and I wanted to start building with people to let them know who I am and to start understanding who they are as individuals. So when I'm putting out requests, when I'm talking about vision, when we're talking about priorities that we're doing it on a human scale. So the first three, four weeks, I basically spent mostly on Zoom, but also some in person, you know, trying to meet with people. And it was very, very intentional to start building this human connection and this human relationship because we are, we are entering into a period of change. As I mentioned, this is, we're a good company um, that's got a great history. But again, if we look out into the, into the, into the future, there's challenges on the horizon. Customers are telling us they want us to be different and there's competitors that want to take business. And there's some fundamental things that we have to do differently, you know, on the operations front, on the commercial front, and I think on the safety front as well. We're not a bad company as far as safety. The numbers look, look, you know, okay. They look, you know, when you look at that, but I don't think the safety culture is as pervasive as what I really want. In other words, I don't think it's, I don't want to be okay or good as safety. I want to be world-class because I think it does start to permeate everything else that we're doing. So, you know, now we're getting, now I'm getting into and talking about these improvement areas and doing some things systematically as far as operations and doing some things on the commercial side that, you know, will, will be different than the way we've worked to, to try to go. But again, if you can do it with trust and do it with leadership, then you get a better chance. And I'm just in the very beginning stages of that because I don't expect after a month or after a couple of conversations that people have that implicit trust. But I think the only way you get it is by defining plan, defi- defining vision, and then and then doing it, so to speak. Well, to, from from before, I mean, part of the part of the issue might have been the paradigms. Part of the issue might be that. And the natural siloing that kind of goes on is is sort of, I think, part of uh, the org chart, if you will, almost, you know, that, uh, like I said, you know, uh, if I help you get a 50% reduction in injuries, that doesn't necessarily improve, if that doesn't improve production, it doesn't necessarily improve my likelihood of getting a promotion or something like that. Um, so you've, they're, but they're all connected. If you can get to, if you can get them to see that it's 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 not it's not separate, that it's it's part of it's part of the same thing. In other words, that you know you know what you're doing. Why do you make mistakes? Rushing, frustration, fatigue, complacency. You're not trying to get hurt. Why do you get hurt? Rushing, frustration, fatigue, complacency. Well, it's just different different but, errors, really. But it's. The but same. I think that's that's the whole point, Larry. About what what how much it sticks determines how much benefit you ultimately get and and look i'll be very transparent within etex 
you know, we were a big company. We were more than a hundred factories around the world. And we did, you know, we did safe start in, in, in everywhere effectively over, over the course of a couple of years, some places worked extremely well, right? Some places were benchmarks as far as taking it and running with it and that having it pervasive. Columbia that made the MTV video. I mean, now, I can't believe that guy sacrificed that song. For, that was a good song. Right. Like, so my, you know, it was original. Like, I, I was going, wow, I'm surprised he didn't try to get that on the radio or something. You know, really cool. And then, yeah, some places, some places, some places, not so not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Do and and I, don't, I don't think there's a bigger answer for it other than, you know, ultimately having the buy-in and the true buy-in on the leadership level all the way down through the organization, you know? Look, every company I've been to, and this includes, you know, everyone I've ever seen, there's, you know, we talked about this. There's always the people that we call the slippery leaders, you know, the ones that will sort of tell you, you agree with you or nod the head, but they're not really. I love that. It. They're not really agreeing. The first time you said that, the slippery leader, I thought, isn't that just a great conference topic title, Alex? Oh my goodness. Yeah. The slippery leaders are hard to deal with. You can't get to be a vice president. And, and go around saying, I'm against health and safety. Right. But you don't necessarily have to do too much either. You can be slippery. Now, and, and, that, and that's the difference. That's the difference is that there's no, you know, and this is what I'm talking about even in my new company, there's no sitting on the sideline if you're a leader. This stuff doesn't happen just because you do the training or just because you put out a few memos. It's got to be demonstrated. It's got to be, you know, I say you got to be a zealot. You have to be a little bit crazy. You know, and, and you saw it when I mean, when I was going around talking about safety and ETEX and my new my new teammates are seeing this now. I'm a little bit crazy. I'm a little bit, you know, this is such it has to be such a passion and people have to feel it um, that that's what makes it stick. And when you're talking about whether this translates to productivity and all these other areas, that I think is the key. Do people feel the same leadership passion and the same commitment and the same energy when you're bringing it there, that they do when you're bringing it to safety. Because safety, I, I'll just say it this way, safety, it's a little bit easier to bring that passion because you're directly talking about human lives and affecting things like that. So if you can't bring passion to safety, you, you know, you really have a problem. But you well, need that, to bring that same thing everywhere. Well, that that that's the, I guess, the question I was going to ask. I mean, there's, there's a certain appeal, um, and you, this is, I think, kind of how it happened at ETEX, that safety is a core value for everybody, and it's also super important. So why not lead in terms of the critical error reduction techniques with safety? And then after the people learn them, just transfer that over to the other things that they do, because it's it's easy to apply it to whatever else you do, like you know, getting ready in a rush. It's easy to make mistakes packing when you're tired. It's easy to make mistakes. So, um, or if, you know, cause we've talked about making a, the, the new, the new program, do you, do you get more traction blending it right from the very beginning so that the examples of the states causing critical errors, but outcomes now not all being safety for the first part of the course. But some of the outcomes, you know, being quality, being being production delays, being being cut, you know, losing customers or, or you know, dissatisfied customers, and and blending it like, in other words, um, you know, I think giving people a more holistic uh, value out of it for learning this and practicing it right from the get go. What what. I mean, which strategy do you think you're going to use going forward? Um, and obviously, the the other thing you mentioned, I just don't want to forget it, so that's why I'm throwing it out here, was, would be tracking the metrics so you can show, like, I don't want to say uh, Jerry Maguire, but show the, you can show them the money right off the bat instead of the, the overall tide rising after a while thing. So which, which way do you think is best to go going forward, Alex, to lead with safety and then and then spin to the others or to blend it all to, to, to make it holistic right from the beginning and try to get, try to get more people, more traction right off the bat and avoid the silo effect. I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I, I can envision it either way. My, my gut tells me. 
Dr. Alex, you're just going to set the direction for safe start for the next 10 years with this answer. But anyhow, go ahead. Look, my, my, my gut says it's still better to focus it on safety, okay? Only because, again, it's a little bit more of a focused area and it's a way that I think people can really get, get, um, get on board. But what I think could be good is to, is to maybe have some introductory topics. In other words, focus it on safety, but have some discussions up front about how these things can apply in other areas. You know what I mean? So in other words, you don't have to have a detail to immediately take it to the other, other areas, but just give, give, the, give the examples and show it that way. Because when I think about it, and even with an ETEX, the places where we had the most success, and you mentioned Columbia, for example, and a lot of our, our sites in Latin America were the same, were the places where they took it outside of the factory as well. You know, they took it to the family and they took it to what was happening every day. And it wasn't just that they took it on the personal level, but they were getting more practice with it. They were seeing it. And, and, and I did that too, when I get in the car and, you know, just the, the, you know, the whole concept of telling stories, you know, we have safe start stories that are about getting in and, and telling your own bit and breaking it down. But that's another element of how you share get the stickiness there. So it, it, it can jump right away. But I think the key area is you can do it either way, but it's whatever in a given organization it takes to get really the full leadership bought in, you know, and getting them passionate around it. So, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, right? So I, you know, I think the leading with safety obviously is the way to go. It's what, it, it's what we did. It's also the business. It's also the business that I was in. I've also had plant managers say you had gold, silver, and zinc in this mine, and you decided to mine the zinc. Why? And I'm like, because I was in the zinc business? I mean, well, you know, you should check out the price of gold and silver because we got to manage everything, Larry, not just safety. You know that, right? You don't manage production. You don't have a job here. Um, you don't manage quality, you don't have a job, and you don't manage safety, you don't have a job. So it's not, it's like, you know, he said, you got four kids, right? I said, yeah. He said, you know, do you just focus on one? He said, no, you focus on them all. But if one's having trouble, you got to go help them a bit more, right? Well, so, you know, I understand, I, I understand all of that too, as well. Like that, you know, you, you also got to be sensitive. Like I remember Floyd Mulligan telling me once, going, Larry, and 22 outages to the grid, unplanned outages to the grid. We have one more. We won't have any safety or anything else to worry about here other than card, you know, like uh, putting putting card um, particle board up on the windows and stuff like, you know, we're mothballing the place. So, you know, I, I understand that you've got to manage everything. At, but I also, I, I also worry that if you silo safety, you, you have more difficulty at the end than I think you should, right? So I, I don't have a definitive answer, but I really like your idea of of maybe making sure that you're you're putting it in front of everybody at the beginning and then just because we can all relate to the safety, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna train you with those kind anyhow, like sorry everybody, I'm getting a little carried away with the, the future here of where we're going with this, but that it's kind of a key focal point for people going forward in, in this is that should you be trying to get human error, first of all, as a blame free concept out in front of people as it affects all aspects of the business um, or you should you just focus focus on the safety aspect first and, and then try to sp try to spread it forward. Um, and your vote, Alex, I guess, is safety, safety first, but kind of make sure everybody sees the connection definitively at the beginning. Like, in other words, you don't. Yeah. And I only say that because I think most organizations are just from a bandwidth standpoint are going to be more suited to start there, get the concepts. But what I think I would try to add, Larry, is, ways to practice it and way to, ways to do it that maybe go beyond safety. And then, in other words, working the muscles and taking it outside, that could be a module that you could have in the safety that, that actually does that. Well, the, the other plus, too, that you mentioned, Alex, that works really well, too, is if you do the safety thing first, there's the natural take it home to the family. You know, we're obviously super big on that. We've 
giving them all kinds of tools, videos, movies, coloring books, activity books, you know, like all kinds of things to help them take this stuff home to their family, as well as access to the course itself if they want it, right, for their, their partners or their teenage, their teenage kids. So that 24-7 aspect where it's, it's in their head and it, it comes back to work without dissipating so much, you know, that's another benefit of the safety thing right off the bat, which, you know, the human error part and taking that home right off the bat isn't going to be nearly as easy for everybody to do, Alex. It just isn't, right? You know, yeah. Um, and Look, it's I think the point, Larry, what I, what I would do is, is actually just up front when we're, talk, when we're talking about with the leaders about what, this, what, what behavior-based safety is or isn't is just say, look, this is the template and this is the basis to actually improve the behavioral aspects and other elements of your business as well, you know, and sort of if that's known up front, then, you know, you can start to see where, you know, where the sequence would be from from safety to to the next areas. Because again, and again, I'm, I'm biased and I'm holistic because I think ultimately it all comes back to the leadership and the culture and the company. So that's where I think each com company is a little bit differently. Well, you know, I mean, you're right. I mean, the right answer to this question, you know, should you start with everything all blended, tackle the paradigm head on, or should you go with the universal need for safety and you can get the 24-7 approach? Which way should you go? The right answer is it depends on where you are, your culture, and, and what you're dealing with. I just sometimes hate you know, sounding like an economist, Alex, you know, it, it depends, you know, one way or another and not and and not being as not being as prescriptive as uh, or, or as definitive for people, because, you know, you can always say it depends. Um, yeah. This one on the screen, interested in your take on the human element for customer facing staff, specifically strategies for managing when the root cause for incidents appears to be non-employees behaving dangerously or aggressively oh my goodness this is an interesting <laughs> question because that uh, just uh the the next the next guest on the show is uh, keith hole um he, he's an mc alex knows him he was the mc for a number of the expert uh, panels he introduced us introduced alex um he's seen a lot of stuff but his uh, previous career he, he owned a pub and then pubs and then started training pub managers on how to deal with the patrons because you want them drinking, but you don't actually want them in fights or breaking rules, right? You want them spending money on alcohol, but you need to control them. So that would be, uh, there, there's, there's, there's a difficult, a difficult non-employee right there. Um, any, um, any any ideas though, Alex? For uh, yeah, I, I saw this question. I, I think it's a difficult question because it's almost the equivalent in safety of somebody intentionally breaking a rule. You know what I mean? Which is always what we say is a little bit outside of the behavioral aspect. Yeah. Um, the, my my initial reaction to this though would be yes. I think there are some processes and techniques that would have to come into play. I think if you if you know about it, I think obviously trying to prepare your people with de-escalation techniques to bring the, the heat down so both your people, the ones facing the customer, don't get into one of the states, you know? In other words, what are the things that can be done to de-escalate situations so your people don't find themselves in a state of, of frustration or, or you know, anger or something like that? Um, that's the kind of stuff you can do ahead of time. And, and there is probably some triggering effects you can do in terms of people recognizing if you've got a noisy customer or somebody, a drunk guy yelling at you that before you get into the rage state yourself that you trigger and, you know, do that type of de-escalation. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly, uh, you know, if you look at big organizations like the, the post office, police forces, obviously, you know, you, you wouldn't need as much training as, a, as a, a post office worker as you would if you were a police officer, obviously, in terms of, you know, de-escalating conflict. But they get some training, basic training, for sure, I think would be the, the step number one. Um, you know, and yet you also have to look at a lot of, um, you know, like the people that deliver furniture and things like that for small little delivery companies um, that get contracted out to 
like say a, a particular big box store they'll use you know harry and his brother to go deliver all the sofas and the the washing machine so you know how much how much training harry and his brother would get at de-escalation i don't know alex but you know again yeah. I mean, certainly at least for whoever's whoever's asking the question my guess is you work for a fairly sizable company so yeah certainly provide some you know some basic training out there on that um another question on the screen um great point on relationship management alex on that topic have you ever correlated safety performance by leader area with leader emotional intelligence? Um, I, I'd say I, I don't have a chart or a form, formal thing because I think it's it's I don't I don't know if I have the metric for emotional intelligence with somebody, but I've certainly done it in my head. And I sort of look at people because I equate the emotional intelligence to me as a very, very strong component of what somebody's leadership capability is. And what I would say is that if I look at it and I think about the people I've, I've worked with that have the highest emotional intelligence, they have a much more likely chance of having a long-term sustainable type of improvement. In, in other words, year to year, I, you know, maybe there's not as much of a correlation, but I think if you have the emotional intelligence where you're getting people to buy in and getting the stickiness, so to speak, then, then you see it, you see it hold you see the gains get held much more. Okay. Um, I don't know if there are, um, <laughs> yeah, Keith thing, it's all about engagement. It's people respect, um, you know, you get their respect and then they'll do what they ask. One, one more question out. I mean, again, it just time flies when I'm talking with you, man. Um, great just to see the success of safe start methodology at work at home. Do you see safe start method evolving? in other levels in the organizations and functions, e.g. boardrooms and on managerial level where key decisions are taken, which may lead to future, don't know what the rest of this is, but um, this is, uh, uh, this actually was how I met Dr. Wada in India on an, ex on an expert panel, and I was challenging the other members of the panel. We were talking about the importance of human factors, behavioral safety training for, for people, the employees. And I said, well, what about for the leaders? And they all kind of talked about, I said, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about overview sessions and update sessions. Okay. I'm talking about training. And I gave them an example of a chemical company in North America where we had trained like 12, 13,000 people, 10 hours. And I got 90 minutes with their executive. I didn't get to train them exactly like I, they got to dip their toe in the water and they could tell you how cold it was kind of from what their big toe said, but they couldn't tell you how to swim at all. Not, not even close. Right. And their, they, their safety pro, the guy actually told me, he said, you got to train all of them. And I'm like, yeah, well, good luck, you know, getting all of those people to actually be trained. So what, what strategies have you got for that? Like, we're going to have to probably close out on this one, Alex, but like, like there's a difference between knowing what's going on and actually being trained in what's going on. In other words, everybody's getting swimming lessons. You still don't know how to swim versus you're going to get in the water and learn how to swim too. Um, what's, I mean, I know you have, so I think that's a great start. Like, you could talk forward, backward, sideways about critical error reduction techniques. You could teach the course. But how are you going to get, you know, what's your strategy there for those guys? Um, look, the ideal strategy is everybody goes through the same training and goes through the same thing. And so that's what we did at ETEX, you know. And again, it, it, we weren't perfect and it didn't, you, you know, but, but everybody had that same basis all the way up to the CEO and the full um, executive committee. So at a minimum, you want people to be able to speak the language there. What's interesting, Larry, is I read that question a little bit differently where they were asking, would the techniques actually help in like a board make strategic or big picture decisions? And it's actually a very intriguing question because uh, I've worked on several companies and worked you know, with several boards. And you, know, you may think that there's always a very disciplined, rigid process. And sometimes when the stuff is hitting the fan, 
you know, things can be a little bit chaotic. Uh, and so it actually can be a very good thing in terms of having people recognize your emotions, your, you being able to trigger um, and things like that to get to a, a good solution. You know, yeah, some boys no, do a very good job, you know, in terms of pausing and reflecting, but it could actually be a very good thing in terms of recognizing your, your state, you know, when you're going through critical business decisions. It's also um, just the equivalent I find rates your state for uh, like before you're going into a conference or, or to a meeting, you know, big meeting, kind of like you're going into a big game, you know, and you kind of do the, that, that pregame, you know, rates your state, like how we're all doing, you know, like get everybody, you know, kind of get in the zone, like get your head together, you know, like this is a big presentation, you know, well, look, a lot of it, it, and it all comes back to, you know, sports, you say it's the same thing. A lot of what you're trying to do is you're trying to subtract and take stuff off of your plate. That's why, you know, you've done the same thing. When you're preparing for a game, you mentally prepare everything you can, what, what the field's going to look like, what the court's going to be, what the defenses are in. You think about all of that ahead of time. So when you're there, you can actually focus on what you're doing. And it's the same thing if when you're working, you know, the more you can take off your plate ahead of time by planning and having the process and having the information ready, then all of a sudden what you're doing feels much more manageable and you're not feeling overloaded or frustrated or et cetera. So, yeah. So, I mean, we've, and you know, Alex, again, we, we spent all this time talking about, you know, performance errors, reducing performance errors and obviously improving performance, but we didn't really move. Um, into the next part, which is the zone. You know, moving into that high perform, moving into that high performance zone. So maybe, um, you know, a couple months down the road. I know you got your hands full, but maybe we could have you back and we could talk about sort of, you know, the. Well, hopefully, you'll even have a bit of success. If we could share with people about moving them. Is because obviously the the errors make you frustrated, almost impossible to. To, to be in the zone you're not you thinking about missing the last shot you're not going to make the next one we all know that but you know if there's um you can self-trigger get into the zone um so we could talk a bit about the high performance zone a couple of months if you could come back because i think that's uh that's the other side of the coin it's a little more it's quite frankly a little more glamorous and appealing than the human error side of the coin really um you know the that that how do, and how do you enable people at your company to get into that peak performance zone? So well, look, and, and it can be, and 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 I've got some of my new teammates I know that are that are invited to join this. So you know, I know hopefully some of them are, are listening in and hearing some of the messages. But I think all of us have one of the things I believe in is an authentic leadership style, and each of us has to find that for ourselves. Whatever works best for you and who you are, and for me. My experience is that teams ultimately work much better if you're going towards something positive. You know, it doesn't mean you can't have accountability. Of course, you have to. Of course, you have to give feedback. Of course, you have to, you know, manage to, you know, the things like that. But when you have a positive goal and you're going towards things, and 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 that's what I see. That's what we had in Etex. We weren't we weren't beating people down, or at least not trying to. We were saying we can be great in safety and we can be a great company. And that's why we're doing these things. And that's why you you change. Change is hard for anybody, but the role of any of us as leaders across any company is to make change happen. You know, and if you're doing well, you're making more for the good, you know. And so it's a, it's always a fun journey. And, you know, but I think the key for me is bringing people along with it. And if you get that and people really understand not just not just the training or not just the books you're doing but actually the, the the real basis and the real why you have a real chance so i know we're running over time larry so i'll, I'll close it out there well no no that, that was great and now it's like say i'd love we'll we'll definitely have you back to talk about this because I, I it's it's sort of another one of these you know how do you and each, part of it is you know you 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 did narrow it down so that the performance could be you know almost perfect with a few simple tasks and so on but that doesn't mean that those people aren't capable of much, much more, especially if you give them some simple tools. And the same thing with with safety. You know, you just got you got to give them more than try to be more careful next time. That's all. You know, you've got better than that. Now, um, two weeks, uh, everybody. Uh, it's going to be a little bit later. It is um, uh, February twenty fifth. 
2 p.m. Eastern, and that will be 7 p.m. in the UK, 8 p.m. in Europe. Uh, Keith Hall will be joining me. Um, I mentioned Keith already. He was the master of ceremonies for a number of uh, conferences that I've spoken at, and uh, Alex and I have been on uh, expert panels with. Keith gets to hear all of the latest, greatest uh, safety 4.0, BBS, human factor, safety 24-7, safety differently. He's He introduces all of the speakers. He's heard all of it. He also does an awful lot of work at construction sites right on the ground floor level. And he can actually tell us what works at the ground floor level. So from, from Mount Olympus to the, the shop floor, uh, what really works with, with Keith Hole. That'll be two weeks from today, but an hour later. Um, and again, Alex, thank you very much for joining us. And we'll have Alex back in, uh, in, in a few months. Um, after he's uh, had a bit of time with the new ball team, and we'll see how he's making out with uh, making out with the performance errors and the integration, the silo effects, and all the challenges. So, Alex, thanks again, everybody. Thanks again very much, and everybody, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, we'll see you all again, hopefully, in, in a couple of weeks. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Larry.